Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 363, featuring part 3 of my interview with Dr. Cat. This part of the interview, we have a smorgasbord of topics. We talk about everything from transhumanism, uh, what Dr. Cat wants to achieve is his life goals. Uh, we also talk about the Ultima One remake uh, that he did back in 1986. And we talk about the uh, travails that developers had to endure back then. <laughs> and the kind of this, all the shenanigans played by publishers, distributors, and retailers like Walmart. Uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes information here I think you'll find really interesting. Uh, so without further ado, here is Dr. Cat. It wasn't that long ago the average lifespan for a human was 30, and, and now oh, yeah. it's over 70 in industrialized nations, and that's amazing, and, and leads to a lot of potential progress. You have a level of wisdom and experience for people guiding projects and doing things that, you know, just was a lot rarer. I mean, people weren't literally dying at 30. Some, somewhere there was a lot of infant mortality, and there were you know, the elder of the tribe made it into his 50s. You know, look, he's still got eight teeth. He's doing well. <laughs> <laughs> so there were old people, but there were a lot less of them, and you wouldn't see them hit 95 or anything, you know, so. And I had Scott, uh, Scott Miller on the show not too long ago, and he was, uh, what was it? He said something like, if you can just make it another 20 years, you'll make it forever. Yeah. You know, something like that. Well, a lot of people are thinking that. Uh, my buddy Jeff D. is a transhumanist, and, and I know some others and I'm skeptical. You know, I think it might happen, but after we're dead, because it's easy to be over optimistic about technological progress, even though it is going at like this crazy accelerating curve during our lifetimes. Um, so I wouldn't totally rule it out. But it's, you know, and biology is really complicated and we don't understand it well, in my opinion. Um, but it, it, it might never be possible. You know, I often I often talk to people like Star Trek you know, is, is a, a notable example for me. They've got the holodeck and faster than light travel and transporters, which are all great technology. And they do time travel. Oh, we, we did a gravity whip around the sun, you know, uh, whatever. Um, these are all things, uh, to me, a lot of people think, oh, anything in science fiction, it's a question of when will it be invented? You know, next year, you know, the 2300s, who knows? But um, there's this kind of faith that everything is possible, which is not true. Um, not only Heisenberg, but uh, Kurt Goodell, the mathematician, have some very concrete examples of proving that certain things are not possible. And I believe in science, there are a number of things that the laws of physics do not allow. I don't know which ones they are. You know, I have suspicions about time travel and transporters, but I could be wrong. But I am, I am very confident that there are some things that cannot be invented, and those things will not be invented, you know, because they're not possible. So um, how far we get with transferring your brain into a computer or making the human body live forever or, you know, putting you in a robot body, I don't know. But I'm not counting on it. I am quite prepared to die, you know, hopefully when I'm around 100 or more. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll take what I get. I, I, you know, I can do a, 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 an awful lot more with all the decades I have left. Uh, I like to think I did a good job with the first few as best I could. Um, certainly could point to places I could have done better, but you know, keep looking forward. And after I die, you know, I hope people keep for Katie running after I die. I don't know if they will. Uh, people will keep inventing games and, and computers and software and improving mankind. Uh, the murder rate or just violent death, wars and everything, the, the rate of people killing people has been going down continuously throughout human history for thousands of years. You know, I, I hope and expect that trend to continue. continue. And uh, yeah, my, my thought, by the way, on this whole transhumanist thing, I think we're evolving into a world mind where each of us is one neuron or a person plus their computer together make up a neuron. That's centaur theory to me. The, the the computer can do a lot of great things in a person, but the two of them together as a team can do things neither of them could do nearly as well alone. You really want that to be your cell. And, um, yeah, I think the, the Internet is kind of the, the, like, spinal core of the world mind or something like that. And I found myself on Facebook one day, and I go through things other friends have posted, and I see a funny cat animated GIF, and I click share. And I realized, oh, my God. I am a neuron filtering neural inputs of various funny photos and news articles and, and whatchamacallit, and I fire my little synaptic signal when I see one I like. You know, I recognize funny cat pictures and cool stuff about gaming 
Facebook, Facebook is becoming the, the, the substrate of the world mind. It's, it's, it's building a neural network with like 2 billion people last I heard. So yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> what I can do to facilitate it. Midwifing the birth of the world mind is, is what I find. Yeah. What I consider to be my secret job. Game, game design is, you know, it's my cover. It's my cover story. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so let's see if we can uh, go back uh, for a minute uh, back to after the Ultima One remake. Uh huh. Not sure how we make that segue, but uh, you probably could. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah. you know, so the, the, so, the more blatant the segue is, the more I like it. To be honest. <laughs> yeah. So on a totally unrelated subject, Ultima One. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a Ultima. I'm, I'm trying to think what it must have been like back then. I guess there was still quite a. You know, diehard, passionate fans of the Ultima series that were very yeah. uh, serious about you know the, the the series. And here's a remake, mm -hmm. and you know, that must have been some somewhat controversial for the fans. But you know, also I don't think anybody would really dispute that some changes were needed, right? To, especially to yeah. appeal to, to new people. So, yeah, I bought I bought Ultima One as soon as it showed up at General Micro, which is the chain of South Bend computer stores where I bought my Apple. You know, they had a showroom at the East Bank Emporium, very nice view of the river. And I bought Ultima One. Um, and, you know, it was as good as Richard could make it at the time. And you can see, especially through the first three or four Ultimas, not only Richard learning about game design and getting better at it, but also learning about programming and getting better at it. You know, Ultima One um, was like Caverns of Freitag, only, you know, a thousand times better. <laughs> But like Caverns of Freitag, it was a basic game with some assembly language subroutines to speed up the core parts, you know, primarily graphics. And Ken Arnold, who, you know, oscilloscope master, Ken, <laughs> <laughs> uh, who did music for all of the early Ultimas and programmed the music routines for Richard. He'd just deliver this package, you know, load this file, you know, access this to change which song is playing. Um, he did some assembly language routines for Richard for Ultima 1. Richard coded everything else, but Ken Arnold did a little of that programming for him. Ultima 2, Richard said, well, I should learn 6502 assembly language like Ken and make a better game. And he did. It was his first assembly language program, happened to be a big hit game, you know, unlike most people's first one. But, um, yeah, Ultima 1 was definitely showing signs of age and, you know, uh, just kind of the look and feel. Ultima 3 had these blue borders with white outlines that just looked visually sharper. Uh, and we put that treatment in the remake of Ultima 1. Um, but we took the old basic code and looked at it said, well, you know, how many hit points did the monsters have? What was the math for the combat die roll and your chance to hit and how much damage a weapon would do? And we took that over, but we put it all in, in assembly language. And yeah, you know, they had origin now. They wanted to, um, you know, be publishing all their own ones, at, uh, their own games. And they thought, well, you know, some of the people who found Ultima with Ultima 2 or 3 never even got a chance to play Ultima 1 yet. And I don't know if California Pacific even still had it in print. And there was no eBay yet, you know. So they said, well, we'll republish this. The people who discovered the series more recently can buy it. Probably some of the really crazy fans, you know, got the original and the remake. But I think mostly it was people that didn't. And then years later, here's the Ultima 1, 2, 3 trilogy in one box. And eventually, uh, 4, 5, 6. Then there's like, here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 all together. Now you go on good old games. You pay good old games and you can download it there. But, uh, I mean, it's it's a better quality when it really fits in more with uh, the later ones. And, uh yeah, so what happened was they gave Dave Holly, who was my roommate, uh, and he did cartoons on the side. He did the Sherwood Forest graphic adventure through Penguin. He was another ex-Penguin like uh, Dave, and Dallas Snell was an ex-Penguin, and Steve News Origin was full of ex-Penguin software guys in the early days. Um, so Dave was was in charge of making Ultima 1, and they said, okay, you know, again, I, I we were probably shooting for Christmas. You usually were in those days, <laughs> and a lot of companies still are. Um, but whatever target we were shooting for, they said, well, you know, uh, and most of the other people have finished up one, one thing or not. Let's take all our programmers, all like, you know, four or five of them <laughs> and we'll split up the, the sub modules of Ultima one and Dave will head it up and he's doing the wilderness, which is like the place you start and the place you go in and out of the other things from. So he'd tie up together and say, here's how you need to set up your data and stuff and communicate with what I'm doing. 
but he just had time to like finish the wilderness because he was also coordinating these other people and documenting and, and, you know, working out data. And, um, so there was also the castles, there were the towns, there were the dungeons, there was the space combat. There was the final battle where you go back in time and, and fight, uh, um, I think it was Mondane. Minax was number two. Mondane was number one. You fight Mondane in the final battle. So there's all these pieces. And Dallas, um, Snell programmed one of them. And um, I forget whether whether Paul Nareff pitched in. He was a freelancer. He wasn't actually an employee at Origin. And he was doing Space Road. But they gave him office space. At first, me and Paul and Dave shared an office, and then they got more space, and we got to spread out. But we would joke about the desk in Brazil, pulled back and forth. Me and Paul Nureff had that desk. You know, we didn't fight over it, but we joked no. about it. Um, but yeah, uh, Steve Muse uh, worked on uh, a little bit of Ultima 4 uh, title sequence programming. He did a module, I believe, for Ultima 1. John Miles was newly hired. He wrote a title sequence, an animated title sequence, in his car, driving from Oklahoma to New Hampshire, he would stop at a hotel, take out his Apple II, work on an animated title sequence for Ultima once more, pack up, drive some more the next day. He shows up in New Hampshire, and he has a disc. He says, I wrote this on the trip. We put it in a computer. Nice animated title sequence, John. We'll use that as is. Great. You know, uh, I was the fastest programmer at Origin in the 1980s. A uh, bit of trivia for you there. I did three of the modules. Everybody else did one. I did three. I did uh, Towns, Castles, and Dungeons for Ultima 1. Because, um, yeah. As a, John Miles, by the way, um, you know, still a teenager when he came out to work at Origin, 17, 18, 19. You know, I, I don't think he was 17, but, you know, corrupting minors, maybe he was. Uh, somewhere around there. He's all eager to prove that he's a faster programmer than me. Set up some kind of programming challenge or showdown, <laughs> right? And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, we don't need to bother. It doesn't matter who's faster. Uh, so we never did, like, you know, settle it with a kind. I I will say to your audience right here, I think John Miles was a better programmer than me overall um, in those days, and then probably still. I don't know what he's doing now. Uh, I should invite him to the stream. Let me make a note. <laughs> Should have a challenge. So many people. It's hard to even <laughs> just make a list of, of everybody. But yeah, um, uh, John John did some great work. He did he did the core graphics routines for the PC that were not only used in the Ultima like opening cutscene to like do panning and and multiplane stuff, but then it was used as the core of the Wing Commander graphics to make this fast action space game on the PC. He did audio libraries to support it, every third-party sound card out there, even though there were a zillion of them. And finally, Microsoft solved their mess um, with, with sound card driver compatibility problems for DirectX. They went to John Miles. They said, we're going to put sound card support in DirectX. It's good enough for game developers. And they licensed his audio library, and they said, please take it. And the changes we need to incorporate it in DirectX and the improvements, you code that too. And, and yeah, his stuff's in the guts of DirectX now. Uh, very good programmer. Um, and uh, yeah, he wanted to he wanted to make fantasy games too, as did I. And that's that's why we came out to join uh, Origin. Of course, Origin at the time thought, oh, they should only have one at a time. So they encouraged us to do other things while Richard kept making Ultimas, uh, which I think was a mistake. I think if you look at companies now that have two or more lines of RPGs and and the market's a lot bigger than those days. Yeah, I told you a hit game was thirty thousand. You know, Ultimas that, you know, go from like 50,000, the next one sold 100,000 or 150,000. You know, they were big hits uh, by the standards of the time. Uh, of course, getting onto the PC, then it became possible to, you know, go go up even in the millions and stuff. I'm, I'm not sure what the highest sales title for uh, sales figure was for, for an Ultima at the peak. But, uh, yeah, back in the 80s, we, you were happy if you sold thirty to 50,000 copies of a game. It was possible for authors to get 30% royalties back in those days, too, which is, yeah. Uh, of course, now you're in indie. You put something on the App Store. People bitch about Apple taking 30%, and the developer gets 70%. I'm like, <laughs> wow, paradise. They only take 30%, you know. Um, and the value of having any kind of distribution or visibility is way more than the amount you lose. And, and you know, indies are, are stupid if they're being stingy about that 30%, but whatever. Uh, I'm 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 happy to <laughs> happy to let them have that cut. And it used to be too, you know. Um, there was the publisher, and then there was the distributor and the computer store, and they all get a cut. 
So, you know, you might be looking at like 40% of the money for your $60 game or $40 game goes to the retailer, you know, computer land or, you know, I was so excited when they showed up in bookstores. I'm like, my games are in B Dalton's, you know, I'm not just for you. I'm in a real store now. You know, <laughs> I've run but 40% to the retailer, 20% to the distributor, and then 40% to the publisher. So that author getting 10 to 30% royalty from the publisher, it's really of that 40% that the publisher ever even sees, you know? So, um, now if you're making games, you're, you're either selling them direct to people or you're selling them through steam or app store and getting 70%. And it's, uh, it's just way more efficient. You, you mentioned Scott Miller, you know, I saw what he was doing with, uh, uh, commander keen and Paganitsu and, and uh, the early games, he and George Broussard made themselves, some in, in CGA four color. And they had, here's a free episode you download off of BBS. Again, there was, you know, no no internet yet. Or, you know, if you're advanced, you get off like Genie or America Online and then pay to get the next two. I'm like, this, this you know, efficient distribution, all direct sales, try before you buy. This is the future, you know. So I you know, jumped on board to do some, some games for Apogee with, with Scott, like early on, because, uh, I thought I was onto something. What ended up happening with that try before you buy all the big game publishers that were in retail started doing it, but they just said, well, you know, here's, here's our, our next big RPG or action game or whatever. Here's a downloadable demo that gives you like the first, you know, 10 minutes or the first half hour of gameplay. And then, Instead of buying online through our 800 number, you still go into like, you know, GameStop or whatever and buy a $50 box. But they were promoting it the way Scott had established you promote things. So, but it, it did allow indies to like do a, an end run around the retail stores, which were hard to get into and be published and make money. You know, all of the early Apogee authors were making very nice royalties they could live on. And Scott and, and George were doing well even before uh, Wolfenstein 3D, which like sent them through the roof, of course, and, and the hit guys too. But yeah, uh, I don't know if you've had any interviews where people have talked about how hideous retail was. Um, have, have you heard about the, these horror stories? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, you know, they, they force game companies to pay them in order to give prominent placement for a game rather than say, oh, it's on our own best interest to put this hit game on that you know, the end cap display. They're like, no, no, not unless you pay us. And they were fighting each other with discounts so much. They weren't making money off the games anyway. You know, they're like, oh, we got it from the, the distributor or the game company for this. And we sell it for like 12 cents more because the, you know, the other retailer cut it down to like 25 cents profit. So no, we had this, oh, our, our price is cheaper. Come to our game chain, you know? So we we're 12. So they were like breaking even on selling games and making money off making publishers pay them bribes to, you know, to carry it at all. And wow. another bribe to like put it in a favorable position or do some local newspaper advertising that was coming out. Just, yeah, it was a crazy business model. It sounds uh, like a, we're way better off now than we were back then. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Origin saved the company with Ultima 6, but it was still shaky until Wing Commander came out because they went from, like, uh, distributed by Electronic Arts to distributed by Broderbund to, like, okay, we're going to take the plunge. We're going to distribute our own software and keep that 20% middleman cut for ourselves, right? And they found out, you know, uh, big chains, uh, Walmart or, you know, GameStop or whoever the big chain is, Target, they'll say, oh, yeah, give us 30,000 copies of your Ultima or your Wing Commander. So it's net 30, net 60, net 90, which means you give us the goods now to put in our store. We pay you in 30, 60, 90 days, whatever the, the number after net was, is when we're supposed to pay you. So you're like, oh, we did net 60. It's like 57 days. Let's call up the target. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mail out the check tomorrow. You know, 64 days. I didn't get the check. Oh, yeah, I, I mailed it yesterday. I'm mailing it today. Blah, blah, blah. Lies, lies, lies. And they just don't pay you because they're making interest on that money or they have cash flow to buy, like, you know, cat food for the cat or whatever the fuck they're doing with it. You know, and then you say, oh, Wing Commander 1 is done. And they say, give us fifty thousand uh, dollars, fifty thousand copies of Wing Commander One. We want in our store. It's like, as soon as you pay me for Ultima Six, and boom, the next day there's a FedEx <laughs> envelope with a big check that oh, they owe you wow. for Ultima Six. You're like, okay, here's some Wing Commander, and that's just that was routine. That was how business was done. You, you had to have multiple. EA, it's no problem. They have a steady stream of products. Origin, it's like, 
wow, this business is harsh. <laughs> and if we're only doing, you know, a few products, you know, we, we could be in really bad cash flow if we don't have a new one to blackmail them with and the paying us what they owe us. So, yeah, horrible business. Online sales is much nicer. Um, uh, so... <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, sorry about the big delay uh, between this episode and the previous one. I uh, took a little trip down to see some family in Florida, contracted this nasty flu-like thing. Uh, took me out for almost two weeks, uh, fortunately. Feeling better now. Uh, still not quite 100%, but I wanted to put this uh, episode out while people still remember what the heck Matt Chat is all about. So, uh, again... Uh, sorry about that, and hopefully the next episode will be up uh, next week as usual. Uh, as always, though, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for your support of Matt Chat. Could not do these episodes without you, so I really, really appreciate it. Grateful to you. Uh, if you would like to help the show, just go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Uh, one buck per episode, you know, four bucks a week, or four, uh, four dollars a month, basically. Uh, all I ask, and uh, I really appreciate it, guys. So uh, thank you very much for all your support. Uh, and also the people that helped me uh, spread the news about these episodes. Really appreciate you, too. So thank you. All right. What about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, I have some fantastic news to start off with here. This is a program I just stumbled across. I was actually looking for reviews of my book, Dungeons and Desktops. It just so happened this uh, guy uh, put a quote from the book on the website. It's how I learned about this uh, tool, so that's pretty cool. It's called the Gold Box Companion. If you know anything about me, uh, you know how big of a fan I am of these Gold Box uh, AD&D uh, AD games uh, from the 80s, uh, late 80s. Uh, so this, you know, if you if you haven't played those before now and you're trying to get into them and it seems like a little bit of a cumbersome setup, uh, you're really going to want to check this uh, Gold Box Companion out. Basically, even if you are really familiar with the games, you might want to check this out too. It's basically a tool uh, that you use in conjunction with the Gold Box games and Unlimited Adventures and even those uh, Buck Rogers games. It's got an auto mapper. It's got the journal entries built into it. It's got a lot of cool interface issues. And uh, he's also done an, an auto mapper for Eye of the Beholder, too. It's a different link uh, to those. But anyway, uh, my advice is if you haven't played the Gold Box games and you're kind of uh, were wondering, uh, maybe it's a little counterintuitive for you or something like that, uh, definitely check out this Gold Box Companion. Or if you're like me and you haven't played them in a while and you don't really want to have to deal with the graph paper and all that again, uh, you might want to check it out, too. It looks really, really neat. Uh, and then a uh, second bit of news here, this is, uh, let's see, Aubriel, Emma York on RPG Watch has posted a, a preview review, I guess, a review of an early access game called Ghost of a Tale. Ghost of a Tale. This is a uh, RPG packaged in something like a bedtime story. So uh, Aubriel describes this. Uh, it's got a hero that's a little mouse uh, named Tilo. And apparently it's uh, inspired somewhat, or at least stuff similar to that Red Bull series, just so happen to be reading those right now, so that's kind of a, that's kind of a coincidence, I suppose. i uh, really enjoying those uh, books. Uh, and it seems like it's kind of a, a family-friendly RPG, so if you've got some uh, little kids uh, that you want to introduce to RPGs, but you don't want something too violent or gory or scary, uh, this might be a good choice. Or if you just really like mice and mouse, hopefully there'll be some rats in there too. Uh, it could be fun. Anyway, it's $19.99 on Steam, early access, uh, or you could read the review here by Aubriel. Post a link to that. And then uh, finally, uh, Torment Tides of New Monero finally has a release date. Uh, this The release date is February 28th, 2017. Had to, might want to check the year in a case like this, right? Uh, so apparently when that date comes, the Steam copy will automatically update to the release build. Uh, if you don't have the game yet, didn't buy it or whatever, it's uh, $44.99 on Steam and you can play it in early access if you want. Uh, but anyway, that's not too far off, so uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that. All right, that'll do it for the news. What about that ale? I feel like it's like the ale of the year. <laughs> uh, what do we have here? Uh, wow. 
Dragon Head. Got an awesome Viking, uh, what do they call those, long boats, long ships uh, here on the, uh, the, the label. 5,000 years in the making. This is from the Orkney Brewery in Quoi, <laughs> looks like Qualud, but I guess it's Quoloi or something like that. Uh, handcrafted in small batches. It's a stout. Uh, alcohol, 4%. Wow, so this is really on the weak side. Uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> I'm not sure what the, uh, the Vikings would have approved of that. Maybe they, maybe they would. Let's see. Dragon Head. Exceptionally smooth stout with a full malt flavor. Let's see. It's dark, intense, fully flavored. It is our tribute to the Vikings and their cultural legacy in Orkney. Uh, and this is, uh, let's see, brewed in Scotland. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, I think this is the first, uh, first beer I've had from Scotland uh, that I know of. Let's see, Saint, uh, it's imported by, let's see, Sinclair Breweries Limited, uh, the Orkney Brewery in Koilu. <laughs> Somebody's probably just ready to kill me about mispronouncing that, sorry. Uh, Stomness, Orkney, Scotland. All right, a little bit more here on the bottle. Gold, uh, hints of spicy golden hops. Uh, so anyway, it looks really interesting. Uh, let's get it open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this dragon head here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Been smelling it, and even though I'm still pretty stopped up, I could still smell sort of a, like a bourbon barrel uh, aroma to this. Kind of smoky uh, scent to it, a little bit of a coffee aroma. It smells really nice, actually. Uh, it'd probably be even stronger if I wasn't so uh, stopped up. So uh, let's hope the flavor is up there with the aroma. Ah, uh, this is uh, really surprising, though. The given that strength of the, uh, the of the aroma on this, I was expecting a lot more flavor. Instead, it's a very very mild flavor. It's a uh, you know I don't really taste any alcohol at all, which I guess is not surprised considering it's uh, only the four uh, percent. It kind of tastes like a like a sort of somewhat bitter chocolate milk. I guess is about the closest I can describe this. Now, let me try it again here. I mean, it's, it's just extremely light, uh, light body on this. You know, I guess uh, you could drink a, <laughs> uh, quite a lot of this and still be uh, fine to play uh, your favorite RPGs. But otherwise, you know, just not really uh, detecting much in the old flavor department. I'll try it one more time here. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just kind of like water with a little bit of a, a stout flavoring in it. Um, you know, I don't know if they had to dumb this down whether they imported it, or imported it, <laughs> imported it or what. Uh, but yeah, just not a lot of flavor here. Uh, full malt flavor, uh, Orcadian stout. I don't know. Uh, just not really impressed, I have to say, uh, with this one. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'll go two out of five drinking horns on it. Not the worst stout I've ever had. And certainly, if you're looking for a, a low alcohol, uh, something that has low alcohol and not a lot of flavor. You know, some people like that, uh, and if you want to have a good scent, you know, they, they definitely topped out my, uh, <laughs> uh, in aroma, uh, just the flavor doesn't quite live up to it. So I think about a two out of five seems about right on this uh, Dragon Hit. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation, and I was uh, looking for quotes about uh, transhumanism and all this, uh, the singularity and all this stuff, and I found this quote by Marvin Minsky, who, if I recall correctly, did a lot of uh, work in AI. Uh, this is from a book he wrote in 1994, or an article. Anyway, the quote goes something like this. Will robots inherit the earth? Yes, but they will be our children. We owe our minds to the deaths and lives of all the creatures that were ever engaged in the struggle called evolution. Our job is to see that all this work shall not end up in meaningless waste. So ponder on that one and see you guys next week.
wanted him to be proud of me. Just once. And now... Ah! My stomach has been pumped and now I'm hungry. Hey, there you are. Hey, man, I'm so hungry I just have to eat. Grimstarch died. I prefer chicken.